Okay, welcome everybody. Tonight is February 19th, 2020. It is 6 p.m. This is a meeting of the Upper Dublin School District Finance Committee, and I'll call the meeting to order. Uh, first, do we have any announcements, Mr. Leckman? We do not have any announcements. Actually, do you have one, Dr. Young? Earlier today, we noticed that um, for finance recommendations 8D, the Montgomery County Intermediate Unit, the numbers for 2021 were correct. The numbers on the chart for 2019, 2020 were not correct. So they've been corrected on public facing materials. Um, and they're, um, it now matches what the motion says that, uh, that our share for next year is $444 less than, than last year. Okay, thank you. We uh, have minutes from our January 23rd meeting. If anyone has corrections, please get them to Brooke so they can be approved next week at the legislative meeting. And we'll dive right into presentations. First up, from Montgomery County Office of Public Health. Do you want to introduce this at all? Yes, tonight we have uh, Aaron McDermott and Megan Young from Montgomery County Department of Health to talk to us about uh, Montgomery County's Medical Countermeasures Program. Uh, we've been approached to become a site uh, for this section of the county, including Upper Dublin and Horsham. Uh, in case there was ever a need for a uh, uh, medical dispensing program, uh, point of dispensing, uh, that we could be a predetermined site, uh, trained and practiced. So uh, they come up tonight and give us a presentation, um, answer any questions that we have about the program. I'm going to try not to make a ton of noise here. Uh, thank you, Bob. Uh, as Bob said, my name is Megan Young. I'm the preparedness coordinator for the Office of Public Health. Uh, you can go to the next one. Um, so we asked to come in tonight and give you guys a little bit of a background on what this program is and what it would mean for Upper Dublin as a township and Upper Dublin as a school district. Um, originally, your site, and I have a map a little later in the program, your site was at um, Congregation Beth Orr, um, and we had moved it to Ambler Ambulance. Those sites have since opted to participate in a different fashion in the program. So we need an area to serve this section of the population within Montgomery County. And it was suggested that you guys uh, may be a site that's willing to partner with us. So no pressure, um, but give you a little background on the program before you make a decision. Um, so the Medical Countermeasures Program um, is a federally funded program. It is not federally mandated, but it is federally supported um, through the Centers for Disease Control and the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response out of uh, Health and Human Services at the federal level. Um, within that program, there's the Strategic National Stockpile. That's all the stuff um, that we would need to respond to any sort of event, whether it's public health, bioterrorism, domestic terrorism, or the like. Um, so it's medications, medical supplies um, that can serve not only the residents of Montgomery County, but those individuals who may present to something like a hospital or a clinic as well. Um, as I said, it is managed by CDC. Um, the allocation is stored at several classified warehouses throughout the country. No matter how hard I try, smile, and bat my eyelashes, the CDC will not tell me where it's stored. Um, but I would like to think because of where we're geographically located between the Capital Beltway region and New York City, probably somewhere pretty close by. Um, so I am confident when CDC gives us delivery numbers that they're probably pretty spot on because of geographically where we're located in the nation. Um, CDC tells us they can have it to our doorstep or to the state doorstep within 12 hours. They have promised that, they have practiced it, it's pretty true. Um, it's designed to assist the locals. Um, and when we say local, we're talking county and state. Um, for terrorist attacks, like we saw with 9-11 and the anthrax letters, um, major national disasters, Katrina, Rita, um, the hurricanes, the earthquakes down in Puerto Rico, uh, the stockpile has been deployed down there quite frequently. Um, pandemics, um, we had H1N1 in 2009. I'm sure all of you remember the big vaccination campaigns that the Office of Public Health, then known as the Health Department, uh, mounted to address that response. Um, and chemical and industrial accidents. We have a lot of industry here in Montgomery County. Um, we hope that nothing ever goes wrong, but God forbid it should, we do have a, a process to respond to that. So the medical countermeasures program is how we take that stockpile and utilize it. So how we take that stuff and turn it into a program. 
Uh, Montgomery County is fortunate that we are one of the five counties in the southeast that does have a county level program. Um, ourselves, Bucks, Delaware, Chester, and the County of Philadelphia all have programs. They're all very similar, which is great for the residents down here. Um, agencies or counties that do not have health departments are served by state health. So there's a state health level program um, and then the federal level program, as I explained earlier. We are 100% grant funded. Um, we do get a substantial amount of funding every year to manage this program, which is great because there's very little if no cost to any of our host sites um, to be a partner. We assume all the costs as the county um, through the funding we get for this program. We and our host sites in partnership are responsible for planning, training, and activating this. We are required to test this at least every five years. Um, so Montgomery County just tested this last October. We used our site at Limerick um, and we ran about 80 people through the point of dispensing in about four hours. It was kind of slow and rainy. It was Halloween. I should have given out Halloween candy, but it's okay. We'll do that next time. Um, so we do test it annually um, and we'll test it again this fall. So requirements, because I'm sure you're like, okay, what does this mean for us? Um, we ask that you utilize your resources. We would like to use your space, um, but we ask that you utilize your resources. Um, you guys know how to best communicate with your populations. You have a large student population, large parent population. You guys do this every day um, in telling them when their kids' homework's due and when their sporting events, things like that. So we would ask to leverage those resources in a public health event to um, communicate with those residents as well. We ask that you guys also maintain order and safety. Again, something I think you guys probably do pretty well, have a pretty good system for, for security. Um, but we're gonna probably be pushing a lot of people through this site. Um, most pods are planned to serve a minimum of 40,000 um, because it's not just Upper Dublin Township. There will be surrounding townships coming in as well um, by the way we have it planned. We would ask that you guys help staff this um, whether it's through your teachers, your school nurses, your parent-teacher organizations, youth soccer, the Girl Scouts, the Boy Scouts, um, and we can assist with some of that volunteer management as is needed. Um, we have a process for doing that within the county. Uh, we ask that you partner with us and train with us, exercise with us. We provide it all to you at no cost. We get to check our box, um, and it gives you guys a chance to test the plan. We also help with all the plan development, um, so it's really... The heaviest list for you guys would be standing it up in an emergency and finding us the volunteers. Everything else we will walk you through and make sure you're good to go. Um, and then the big thing is have a signed agreement with the county so that when this time comes, we can activate. So Upper Dublin, we have many different kinds of points of dispensing, open and closed. Um, Upper Dublin would be considered an open point of dispensing or a public point of dispensing. Currently, we have 14 that are planned throughout the county, and I think the next slide has the map. Um, you guys would be number 15, and we have a 16th in the works. So the goal for the end of this year is to have 16 planned sites. Um, those sites are responsible for 75% of the county population. So we're talking somewhere in the area of 600,000 people. Um, what we're trying to do is leverage the closed sites within the county, large industry, churches, uh, long-term care facilities, home care agencies that can serve their specific populations to take some of the lift off of our public sites, reduce the number of people that would be coming in, try to get that number below 40,000 if we can. Um, but we would also, you know, have to serve the public as well. Um, the operations timeline is dependent on the pathogen. So if we're talking about something like anthrax, a bioagent such as that, it's a very short, what we call flash to bang, very short um, exposure to onset time period. So 48 hours from the time we first get a case or a suspicion of a case until we want to have everybody through those pods. So it's very intense. It's very quick. There will be a lot of communication flying back and forth between the sites and the county and what we're doing. Um, if we're talking about something like H1N1 where we have more of a slow ramp up, we have a longer onset time till we start seeing cases, we have a little bit more time to plan our response, then we can do this in more of a controlled, um, 
methodical fashion like we did with H1N1. Um, and in that case, we may or may not open all of our sites. With H1N1, I think we only opened three or four within the county, more of our larger, um, larger sites. All of the pods, we'd like to have them planned for walk-through and drive-through capability. Uh, we also leave that up to the site if they say, look, I don't really want people walking through the building to ensure security. Then we go with just a straight drive-through model. Um, if the parking lot doesn't work, doesn't have a lot of uh, throughput, we can have people come into the building. We can help you plan whatever works best for the school district. Um, open pods will have their medications delivered to them. We will work with your emergency manager and public works um, for Upper Dublin Township to have that delivered here to you guys. They may reach out and say, is there any way the school district can support us, but we'll help um, facilitate all of that. Um, like I said, they're normally done through the Public Works Association. This is our beautiful map of where our pods currently are. It is a little hard to see, um, but we're looking to do uh, 16 sites. 14 of those are already planned. We need to get one up in the New Hanover area. That's the 16th site. So for staffing, um, like I said, the, the big lift for you guys is the staffing of this. Um, we would ask that Upper Dublin, as the school district, in conjunction with your township, um, develop some sort of command team that's going to lead this point of dispensing if you agree to sign on. Somebody that knows the building um, can get access to what we need to get access to, has access to the resources that the school district has, um, can work with your emergency manager uh, to make sure that the resources that they need are here. Um, and then volunteers. And volunteers is a huge thing for this program as a whole. Nobody has enough of them. Um, so we ask, we're starting to encourage our sites to look at some of those non-traditional resources, the Girl Scouts, the Boy Scouts, um, youth, youth sports, um, some of those parent-teacher organizations to find those non-traditional volunteers. We can come in and do all the volunteer training. Uh, we have a system to credential all of the volunteers if that's what you guys choose, um, unless you have a system to do it um, in-house. So some of the benefits, because I'm sure the big question is what are we going to get out of this? Um, some of the benefits is supporting the community. We look for sites that the community knows. Everybody knows where their local school district is. Everybody knows where their township building is. So we look for those known sites within the community to partner with. Also using schools, you guys are a trusted entity within the community. Um, so it's a sense of familiarity and a sense of safety. These situations are going to be high intensity and high anxiety. There's a lot of unsureness. Um, so we want to point people in a direction of something they know and something they're comfortable with. The other benefit is people know that they're going to be protected, they're going to get their medication, and they know where they're going to get it from. The benefit of having volunteers in-house is they would get their medications first so that they can serve um, the population coming through. It also helps provide collaboration between the school district and the community, which is always a plus for us. We love having partners like school district um, that we can then partner with on other initiatives because we have those preformed relationships. Um, and again, that familiarity within the community. So my contact information and our, our pod planners contact information is on there. Um, if there's any questions you think of after tonight, uh, feel free to shoot one of us an email. We're more than happy to give you an answer um, or address any concerns that you might have. And I think that's all that I've got. Okay, thank you. Are there any uh, comments or questions from members of the community or the board? Amy's nodding emphatically. <laughs> Thank you for coming tonight. Um, before I ask any questions, um, Dr. Yanni, have there been any discussions at the Montgomery County superintendent's level about this programming? Or is there anything you want to add before I dive into my 10 questions? Nothing specific. Uh, okay. Thank you. Okay. So maybe we'll just go one at a time through my questions sure. just because some of them are yes, no, and, and, okay. and pretty straightforward. <laughs> So I'm looking at your map, and there's a list of other schools and school districts listed. Mm -hmm. Are those sites already on board and committed? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so we are the last one to hold out other than the new Hanover, you said? Right, so not every school district in Montgomery County is a site. 
Okay. Let me so preface it by that. It's just here. the ones listed. Okay. And the ones that are listed, we have agreements with. Okay. So we had talked about putting school, uh, putting when this program was incepted in 2009, there was talk of putting one in every school district. Okay. And it was determined, as far as I understand, that was before my time, that that lift was too much on the local resources. So they opted to group them together. The okay. other thing is with this, some of the schools are also partnered with the county as shelters. So we try to not, if we're going to open a shelter, we don't want to open a pod at the same location and drain those resources. Okay. So that somewhat answers my question that a pod would not be a permanent housing for anybody during no. the emergency. No. Okay. This is literally, and we took that slide out because um, we do it in a more in-depth training. Okay. Um, pods are not clinics and clinics are not pods. So you literally have people coming in, they're either getting pill-based antibiotics for something like a bioterrorism attack, or they're getting a vaccine like pandemic influenza. They're in and they're out. And if okay. they're symptomatic, we make the decision of whether they're coming in or we're sending them right to a hospital. And by we, do you mean your agency and organization or the CDC? Um, it'll be our medical authority in conjunction with all of our sites. Okay. Um, we have, you know, certainly got township, uh, police, fire, ambulance. Mm -hmm. I gave Bob a, a knowing look at some point <laughs> because Bob is a, is a volunteer fireman here. Yep. Um, is this something that you've already presented to the municipalities or you would expect for us to, as the pod site, coordinate with those folks as well in terms of volunteers or do they already have other roles in this process? So a little bit of all three. Okay. Um, so we did reach out to the emergency management coordinator for Upper Dublin Township, mm. Paul Leonard, um, and he put us in touch with y'all um, and said, go to the school district directly. And we're like, okay, that works. Um, so he is aware um, that we are looking at Upper Dublin as a site. Um, we can have, so give me your second question again about the first response. Oh, man, so I'm not even sure. I should have just stopped it one at a time. No, um, I, I guess my question was, if they all have other roles to play, mm -hmm. potentially, the municipality, the police and fire, mm -hmm. we would then not be able to double dip and utilize them as our volunteers and staffing. Right. So it becomes a conversation between the school district and the township. And each pod is a little bit different. And you kind of, the uniqueness about this program is you kind of get to make it work whatever way works best for Upper Dublin. So we have some townships that the school is just the site. The school does not provide any command staff. The school does not provide any volunteers. They literally unlock the doors, turn the lights on, and say, we'll see in 48 hours. Um, and the municipality comes in. They provide all the volunteers. They provide all the command staff. It works fabulously. We have other schools that are like, you know what? We have a really good relationship with our first responders. They can't give us everything because they do still have to, you know, maintain law and order and provide fire services and all of that. Um, but they can give us some contingent of it, and they figure out a way to work, make it work in unison. Um, others, the fire department is completely out of it, and the school staffs it all on their own. So whatever way between you guys, the township, and the supporting municipalities come up with that it works, we're open to that. And we're more than willing to help foster some of those meetings. How many volunteers would you need over the course of, let's say, a 48-hour event or even per day on shifts? Is it 8-hour shift, hour shifts? 12-hour shifts? 12-hour shifts, two 12-hour shifts per day. Um, mm -hmm. And we are working on solidifying numbers for everybody as far as, so what we're doing, an initiative we took on this year with the health department is there's no set formula and there's no magic number. Mm -hmm. as to how many volunteers you absolutely need. Mm -hmm. And it all depends on how much medication is going to come in at a time. It's mm -hmm. not all coming in at once. So it's not going to be the CDC is going to drop off 50,000 doses for Upper Dublin Township, and I don't know that that's your number off the top of my mm -hmm. head. Um, it may come in in increments, 5%, 10%. So what we're doing is we're developing a staffing outline of if this much comes in, this is how many volunteers we need to have. Max capacity, if you have over 100,000 people coming into your pod, which you guys are not that big, um, we're looking at about 200 volunteers for an operation. Um, in terms of you referencing, you know, potentially having 
youth, children as the volunteers, and medications. My old pharmaceutical training is kicking in here and saying that might not be the best mix. Do you have a sense for what roles some of the volunteers would play in these uh, situations? So we wouldn't necessarily have youth as volunteers. It's more of the, the parents of, you know, the youth sports programs. I think. All right. That, that's a helpful clarification. Yeah, Thank you. So that's the okay. parents, not the kids. Um, the only time that children would necessarily be involved in a pod operation is if we have somebody who's between the age of like 14 and 18, who's the best person to pick up for that household. And that's literally pill-based medication. And where we run into that a lot is where we have some minority populations mm -hmm. where mom and dad may not have English as their first language. Mm -hmm. Kiddo's the best one to come through the pod. So we do waive that. Um, we don't stick to that they have to be 18 thing. But when it comes to volunteers, 18 and older, um, and their, their job, so to speak, would be anything. It could be greeting people at the door and handing out forms all the way up to if we have medically credentialed persons doing that screening and actually passing out those medications. All right. I mean, I have many more questions. Should I just keep going or do other people? Okay. Um, if we have 40,000 people coming through, let's say hypothetically, mm -hmm. um, who would be responsible potentially for any damage or cleaning for the facility because we are talking about potential contamination, um, exposures, things like that, foot traffic? So it depends on the pathogen as far as how much decontamination you're going to need to do. Um, we would get that at the time of the emergency. But what we have started doing is writing that into the mutual operating agreement that we have signed every year with our host sites of this is what we as the county are responsible for. This is what the site is responsible for. And we're open to, so a lot of times what we do is we'll say printing is the big one that comes up. Cleaning, we're still working through, but printing is the big one that comes up. We ask our sites to be responsible for printing the materials, mm -hmm. the paperwork that comes out. Um, they said to us, a lot of schools and sites have said to us, you want me to print 40,000 copies and pay for that. And I was like, yes. And then I want you to hold on to your receipt because we're going to try to get a federal de disaster declaration and ask for a reimbursement. So we write that in there that there may be some initial upfront costs and that we will look for emergency funding to reimburse all of our host sites. We try to make this as much as possible, no cost to the host sites. I'm much less concerned about copying than I am about damage to the physical plant or contaminants. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's probably more of a, a sticking issue. You can have our paper. Um, I guess the other question, um, I went through actually a site mm -hmm. uh, during the H1N1 at Beth Orr okay. as a pregnant woman having to have the vaccine mm -hmm. uh, at the time. Is that, like, when are you looking to sign these agreements? There are potential things out there in the ether right now that we might have to run a vaccination site. I mean, mm -hmm. are we looking at doing this now and six months, a year? What, what's your so goal? We're I would love, ideally, to have your site signed on by the end of this calendar year, the end of 2020. Um, we understand this is not a quick process. There's a lot of things that have to be thought through. Okay. Um, there's a lot of training then that also has to be done. There's mm -hmm. walkthrough and planning that has to be done. This is not a quick process. Um, we understand that. Okay. We're willing to make it as quick or as slow as the township needs it to be or the school district needs it to be. Okay. Okay. I'll take a break. But thank you. All right. Appreciate it. Thanks, Amy. Anyone else? Comments or questions? Jen. So you talked about running practice mm -hmm. drills. Um, when does that happen? Is it disrupting the school schedules of the other high schools? Like, how do they do it? It doesn't have to disrupt the school schedule. So where you try to be very cognizant, especially with our school-based points of dispensing, not to disrupt the school schedule. So with the school-based pods, we try to get them in over the summer or on an in-service day. Really, whatever works for the district, we're open to. We like each site to test at least once every five years at minimum. Now, you can do that as part of our large-scale drills that we do every five years, um, or you can do a standalone drill on your own. We run exercises every single year, and we try to do one open and one closed each year. So one in like a long-term care facility and one in a school district. And the, the paper, do we need the printing for the practice? Do we have to print 40,000? 
copies? Not 40,000. No, you don't <laughs> need to print 40,000. We may ask for you guys to make some copies, um, but what we do is we, um, we set aside training money for this every year. So things like that get absorbed as part of the exercise costs. So again, we try to limit, extremely limit the amount of out-of-pocket for any of our sites. And what about, is it, does it have to be the high school? Like, could it nope. be one of the other schools? Mm -hmm. okay. It can be whatever building that the school district is comfortable with. And what we can even do, um, we've done this in a couple other places with some of our larger sites. We will go in and plan the, with the help of the school district, we will go in and plan uh, what we call throughputs. So how we're moving people through like the gymnasiums and the hallways and similarly through the parking lots if we're doing driving. Um, we do them for each of the buildings in the district that they say we may, depending on the emergency, want to open this one versus this one. So we can do that for any site that the district deems acceptable. Any, <laughs> anyone else? Teacher. Just two questions. Um, the first one is the training uh, requirement. In terms of length, in terms of hours, what can we expect? So we don't have a set length. Um, we try to tailor it to whatever the needs of the school district or the host site is. Our Pod 101 training, which is the one that we would want to do with anyone who's going to volunteer for the site, that one runs at least 90 minutes. That one's pretty intensive because it goes step by step through what a point of dispensing is, what to expect. We talk about some of the um, access and functional needs considerations. Um, so that one is a little bit longer. From there, we can make them as short as 30 minutes if you just want refreshers. Um, but that Pod 101 training is, is pretty intense. And do, do all volunteers need that? Um, is that sort of the, the center group of people involved? So your core group of volunteers should have that. We do have a just-in-time training. So if you're going to get people, say, I'm going to activate it tomorrow, which we're not going to do. But, you know, if we have to activate it tomorrow, we have a shorter version for individuals that were not on that original core list that are going to help support the operation. So we can do it just-in-time if we have to. And then the other question is the grant. Um, mm -hmm. You say you're grant-funded. Mm -hmm. um, what's the length of the grant? What happens when the grant ceases to be funded, what are our responsibilities that we have so after it? So the grant has been in since 2001. Um, we have no expectation that the grant will end um, anytime soon. Um, the responsibility for you guys, if the funding ends, the county may take, so we have containers that are pre-deployed with things like generators, cones, um, some clipboards, things like that. If the grant funding ends, the county may pull some of those assets back. Um, but other than that, there would really be no impact to the school district other than you wouldn't necessarily be a site if the program would end because there may be no sites within the county if the program ends. Hmm? Stan, you have something? I'm a little concerned that this would open us up to litigation. Someone falls, wants to school, sue the school district. Someone catches this pathogen and says, blames the school district because, you know, we always, we're, we have to defend ourselves. So mm -hmm. either if we win or lose, we still have to pay the solicitor fees. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious who, who takes that response, takes who, whose responsibility is that? So I will check back with our solicitor, I don't know the exact answer to your question as far as somebody falling on your property. Um, when it comes to things like the pathogen, um, if this is activated for response to a pathogen, it's covered under what we call the PREP Act, which is the federal mass dispensing legislation, so to speak. Um, it covers all the volunteers here for liability um, and medical uh, malpractice as long as they're not operating under gross negligence um, or operating outside of their accepted scope of practice. The PREP Act has been tested all the way up to the Supreme Court and has passed um, and held up. So that is the legislation that we operate under with this program. You got more, Amy? All right, I have a couple of questions. Um, I'm surprised to see so many schools on the list in the current climate of school safety. It mm -hmm. feels like township facilities would be preferred. Am I... Is, 
is there something I'm missing? Is there some reason why school facilities are, are preferred? We have no preference when it comes to the, to the county's position on it. We have no preference. Um, we originally approached schools because they have huge geographical footprints, um, which allows us to push more people through. Um, they also are known entities within the community. Um, and before, townships had very small buildings, so it was very hard to push them through. Um, we have no preference as far as the county goes. It's just that you guys have the big footprint. But the physical size of the building is, mm -hmm. is helpful? Yes. Okay. Um, and now, if your township would say, you know what, let's move it across the street to the township building, we wouldn't say no. Yeah. Okay. And, so, and based on the map, we'd be coordinating with Ambler and Horsham and Lower Gwinnett? Yes. And what form does that communicate, does that coordination for us? I mean, in terms of, you know, how relationships we might need to build, mm -hmm. how does that So does we that would leverage that coordination between the municipal entities through your emergency management coordinator. Um, that's the entity that we really rely on. They have those relationships already for handling other emergencies. Um, so we would leverage that to help build those municipal relationships um, and additionally, to reach out to them to see where they may have a source of volunteers within their community that could help support your operation. So were those relationships already in place when the pod was at Ambler Ambulance or Beth Orr? I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. That was before my time. And there um, may have been volunteers already lined up? There when... may have been, and I know Beth Orr has, they have stayed on with the program just in a different capacity. So the other option that we're looking at is some of these private points of dispensing, um, especially some of our long-term care facilities that have said, you know what, we're going to get our small population of 100 people prophylaxed pretty fast, but then we're going to have this plethora of staff that we could turn over to help you. Um, so we're also looking to leverage those existing relationships within the community to help support the public operation. Amy, you're up. <laughs> okay, so First of all, this is a lot to digest, mm -hmm. but I think it's really important. And there's clearly a lot of important discussion that has to happen. Mm -hmm. um, so I appreciate the fact that this is not hear it today and vote on it tomorrow. So yeah. thank you for, for giving us some time to, to go through all this. I certainly think one area that this district and, and probably many can really be of use is the communication piece mm -hmm. because we've already got so many structures in place. So I'd certainly like to see us doing that. Beyond that, I, I just have a potential proposal for, for how to move forward. Um, it seems like a lot of stakeholders would potentially be involved. Mm -hmm. So I think if we're going to have this consideration, we need to regroup and have conversations with fire department, the police department, the township, mm -hmm. and so on, and those other municipalities involved the other superintendents, Dr. Yanni, you know, clearly who are already on board with this. So do you have a timeline for like, are you going to come back to us and revisit this? Do we send you questions? Does that seem feasible? I'm just sort of throwing this idea out to. I, I think it's completely feasible. Um, I think that that might be a great next step. Um, if you guys are willing to consider as being the site and you're open to that conversation, I think that the, lo the logical next step would be let's bring in those other stakeholders, the fire department, the police department, um, your EMS service and your emergency management coordinator, and let's have those conversations of who's comfortable with handling what, where do we maybe have gaps that we need to address, and that all goes into that plan development. So I, I think that's a reasonable next step. We can add this as an agenda item at our next quarterly meeting with the township, which is coming up actually next month. Uh, I think a lot of conversation has to go into this um, because uh, when, if we act as a site, there would be potentially a lot of people going through our buildings and there would be other agencies that we would have to coordinate with. And, you know, I, this needs a lot more discussion. All right. Anyone else have comments or questions? All right. Thank you very thank much you. for the presentation. We obviously have a lot to think about, um, and I'm confident we will be in touch. All right. Let me pull up the agenda again. Um, okay. So we will...
move on to the reports and recommendations. First up, we've got the Sandy Run Middle School update, and I see Zach is. Yep, yep. I'm going to take to go. a seat here, if you don't mind. Um, show you. I just wanted to start by saying thank you for having us back. Arif's going to talk about the uh, ACE grant, and I'm going to give you a. I'm going to give you a quick um, update on the middle school project. Last time we were here, um, we were just getting out of the ground, um, and there's been uh, there's been some major progress since the last time I spoke with you all. So this was one of our phasing plans from early on, and there was a couple milestone dates to meet on here. Um, the annex building is gone. That's completed. Um, the site underground utilities and stormwater basin, I'll show you a couple pictures of, of those items, but that, what, that is also completed already. And the trailers and the staging area, the trailers actually arrived today and yesterday, and the staging area ha has been complete so we can get some things off the, uh, off the actual building pad. Um, here again, a couple milestone dates. The building pad for the classroom wing, which is down here, uh, that building pad has been completed. And the main building pad to complete in June, we're, I don't want to say 100%, that's tough, but we, I will say that that pad is just about complete. Okay? Um, there were some special excavations. What that means is due to the soil types that are down here, uh, some soils had to be removed and some structural fill had to be put in prior to building the building pad. Um, that has all been completed for not only the main building pad, but for the classroom as well. So special, special excavations have been completed. Uh, here's just a couple of photos. This is when I referred to the underground basin that has been completed. That's what this is here. This is ground level up here. Um, on top of this underground basin is where we currently have the staging area, and when the construction project is done, that's going to be one of your multi-purpose fields. But what happens here is the water from, the, from the, uh, the neighborhood and the site comes into this underground basin. This gets completely filled up with stone up to this level, and what that water that, that enters that underground basin does is it slowly infiltrates back through the ground replenishing the, the uh, replenishing the groundwater. If there's a super storm, one of these outflow structures here, there's two orifices in there, one low one if it gets high enough, and then there's another high, and then it, over the top, there's a baffle. So in the event that, what, that we have so much water in this basin that it does go out into the sandy run, it'll be that, that water that's on top, so it's clean, it's not the sediment-laden water so this is one of the best management practices. And again, um, this picture was taken a couple weeks ago. That basin is now complete. When I referred to some of the stormwater on site, um, here's just a photograph of, of what that looks like. This is an inlet here. This will be in a future parking lot, and that is already tied into the basins. And this is the drive out. Autobahn Drive is up here. Um, so we did have this, this inlet does drain down, even though it's going uphill. So this was quite a bit, um, that was a 20-foot excavation there. And if you remember a few weeks back, actually it was a few months back around Thanksgiving when we had to reroute the buses, that was for that reason. So since then, we've actually put a macadam path in here, and this gives the place for the student walkers to be segregated from traffic. So a couple more of the milestones in, in, in reference to site work um, that we have completed. As I said, uh, we have established a building pad and the special excavation, that's, that, it, that is complete. Um, the rerouting, there was some, from the existing building here, there was two, uh, there was one sanitary line and one storm line that needed to get relocated around the building. That has, that has been, around the new building, that has been completed. Um, and the underground water service, um, where your existing water line comes in up here and feeds this building, we had to reroute through um, that has been completed, and the building pad for the main building itself, as I had stated earlier, to complete in June, we are well on track to complete that. Um, as far as the building itself goes, um, the, I keep stating the building pad, that's one item that has been completed. Um, the retaining wall, which you're going to see a, a picture of coming up, that's about, I want to say that that's almost 80% complete. 
and I base that number on the amount of concrete that goes in the footings and the wall, and that is what that retaining wall starts here, and it goes. That's what makes your ground floor, and then your elevated slab makes your first floor. So we'll we'll, we'll get into that. That's about 80% complete, and again, the foundations for the main building. That work has been completed as well. So again, we are on schedule. Um, this was a photograph that was actually taken this morning by Jason. Thank you. Um, so you can see here, this is the classroom wing, and this is also the classroom wing. This is down one. This is what they're going to call the ground level. This is the three-story section. And then here is your main building pad. This is where the, uh, the, the cafeteria is going to be here. You're going to have your auditorium here, your um, gymnasium, locker rooms, auxiliary gym. So that, that pad's done. Uh, when I'm referring to that retaining wall that I had, that's this big wall here, and it comes around the planetarium. This just got a little, little bit there, got excavated today, and concrete was placed, and that wall comes down here. Okay, so um, building pad and the masonry is up in this area. The masonry is up to the top of the first floor. So we are ready to um, stay on schedule with the beginning of structural steel the first week in March. Okay. Again, just another shot. This is just showing another angle. Um, I wanted to put this one in the presentation because I said we're on track for uh, steel to start in this area the first week in March. As you can see, there's, there's structural steel here that's on site. There's structural steel here that's on site. So we're ready to move. Um, when I mentioned that retaining wall that, that I just pointed to you, there is a lot that goes into that. Um, these are the footings. This is before concrete's placed. This is the massive amount of reinforcing steel that is in the footing. This will be a column here. And when you see this vertical steel comes up out, so this is a concrete that's been placed. This is the steel that you see here. And then th what you see behind this is that wall. We have to form the wall first, continue, continue this reinforcing steel up. Um, my role is to make sure that that is all put in correctly according to, to the details. Once I check all that, then we call in the authorities having jurisdiction so they can then generate their reports. We don't want any reports saying that things are missing or not, so I'll check everything first before I schedule those inspections. So that's portion of the retain. Now you can see both sides of the wall are formed here, and they're pumping concrete in. Okay, I wanted to give you that pr pr perspective after the last photograph. And then on this side here, above this is w where your library is going to be. This all gets filled in. It actually is filled in already. On the other side of this wall, that's your, that will be your first floor, or your ground floor classroom area. Okay. So here the forms have been stripped, the concrete's been placed for that retaining wall. And then now before we backfill to put the library on top, um, there's a massive amount. This is just one small bit of electrical conduit that, that comes into that classroom wing. So that gets placed first. And again, the authorities having jurisdiction come out. The code inspections looks at it. They make sure everything's OK. And then we backfill that. So that's that same wall that you see here. The electrical conduit was underneath. And this is the structural fill material that's all being imported that gets compacted. And your library is going to sit on top. This black stuff you see on the wall, that's your damp proofing. Any questions so far? Okay. Um, I did want to put this one in because we are doing the um, BIM coordination. And for the first two floors of the classroom wing, all of the mechanical, electrical, plumbing, um, data wiring, cable tray, all of that stuff, that has already all been coordinated and the contractors have signed off on. Um, Um, so we do that all 3D first before anything gets procured, fabricated. Um, so all of that ductwork for the first and second floors currently is in production, and we know it's all going to fit and where it needs to go. Just a couple photographs on details. Uh, this is uh, masonry bearing walls in the classroom wing, and there is a lot to look at here. Again, I check all of these details, make sure they match the drawings before we call it any authorities having jurisdiction. Uh, there's the insulation that's here. Um, in this case, this is, a, this is a, a bond beam. What that means is there needs to be horizontal reinforcing steel in there, and then that gets grouted solid, as you can see here. 
and the bearing plates get set. And that happens four times just in those, in those three stories on the classroom wing. So a lot to look at. Um, just some uh, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing coordination with utilities through the sleeves. Uh, this does, this is a foundation wall here. That's the footing, the foundation wall. Your, uh, this all gets grouted solid, and this ends up to be about your floor height. But things have to get coordinated first. In this case, there's the electrical conduits that need to get placed. And we don't want to core through the wall. We want to figure this stuff out first. And then again, here is an example of a plumbing sleeve that's going to, this is going to be your uh, storm that's going to catch your roof drains, come down through the building and go out through the, fount through the footing. So this sleeve, that's a steel sleeve that's there because this block will end up being placed over top. And if there's any differential sediment, we want to make sure those pipes don't break, that type of thing. So just a lot of coordination with the utilities through the foundation. And then this was a slide from, from an, an earlier presentation, but I just wanted to say that um, th this is working. The phasing for the buses and the vehicles, it does, I have driven this in the morning when the parents are dropping off and the buses are coming in. It is a little tight, but it certainly does work. The buses are using this route up through here and they're going out. The parents to drop off are turning around. Um, that little um, pedestrian we made for the walkers, that's up here. That keeps them segregated from, from any traffic. The site fencing, security fencing's been completed. Uh, the staging area, again, has been completed. So we've got the trailers on site. Annex building gone. Uh, construction entrances are in. And I've met with the township on several occasions to discuss uh, traffic for um, any incoming truck traffic that we don't want them up here on, on, on Twining Road. So everybody uh, knows what's expected of them. So I believe with that, I'm going to turn it over to Arif. You guys have any questions on the update before we go? By the way, he cleans up uh, real well, doesn't he? <laughs> you don't see him this off looking this way, man. He, he put I, I a suit on for, for you guys and everything, a jacket, sport coat. By the way, one other, one other comment. He was an understudy at one point to uh, somebody who you guys are all familiar with, Warren Garricky. So uh, you can see some of, some of his skill sets um, from Warren. So. Sorry. I know the weather's been cooperating, but I mean, Saturday's supposed to be really nice. Are, are the guys are, are the, you know, site working on Saturdays? Uh, the Masons have worked on Saturdays already. Yeah, two Saturdays ago, they, they had that opportunity to work, so they. Other comments or questions? Jeff? Zach, you're talking about the one pad um, that's almost done and it looks like it's about three months ahead of schedule. Like, in terms of follow-on activities, will work immediately progress there, or is that in a different phase? I'm just. Um, does that makes sense. You're talking. I hate to back up, but this this area here. Yeah, I think you said it was like the main building slab. Yes, this area th that is. Right here you see the staging area. That is the underground basin that I showed you. It's now been covered up with, with fabric and stone because we're using that. We're going to take all of this material and these guys that, that are parked here and we're going to move it over there so we can continue. As soon as this, er this area is going to, area A here we're calling it, is going to progress. The masons are going to um, then start their block here, get up to the first level as they are. Then we're going to start a structural steel in this area. And when the structural steel is going on here, the contractor is going to be working up here doing footings just like they did down here. So yes, there, there certainly is starting to get a good flow so everybody knows where they need to be. Did I answer your question? Yes. Yeah, okay. Anyone else? Stan? Are the floors going to be precast or are they going to be uh, poured floors? They are, they are going to be poured floors. Okay. All right. Um, Arif, why don't we go ahead with the ACE grant? Okay, so I get to do the fun stuff every time. It was the same thing. The architect does the pretty pictures, and I got to tell you guys about numbers and points and credits. Jeez. All right. Well, anyway, so one of the things that we had done here um, during design phase, and some of you will recall this, is we had looked at uh, pursuit of an ACE grant, which is called, um, anybody know what ACE stands for? We're doing abbreviations here, so you guys love acronyms, abbreviations, alternative and clean energy. Okay, so that was what it was. And one of the requirements for the ACE grant was to achieve LEED gold. Okay, how about LEED? Anybody know what LEED stands for? 
because you guys are actually following it to the T. The actual, what it stands for, you guys are following it, and I'll show you why. Anybody? No? Leadership in Environmental and Energy Design. Okay? So today is like, uh, it's been like a teaching exercise. Remember building as a teaching tool? I think Zach could do that at the high school class with this update somewhere. If you guys are interested, that could be fun for some of the high school students. I'm not sure the middle schoolers, but definitely the high schoolers. So what I put in front of you, and I think we have a handout because it's really hard to read, is the LEED scorecard. And so what we did was um, we prepped the building design and construction to be able to target LEED gold. In order to get LEED gold, you have to get 60 points. So it's easier to see on the sheet. Um, it's on the bottom right there on your sheets. You can see to get gold, it was 60 points. So I'm just giving you a quick overview. Some of you might already know this, but um, I, I see some new board members that might be interested in just uh, seeing this. So, so you got 60 points you have to achieve. Now what you do with LEED is you actually look at the different areas and you target credits. Some are prerequisites, meaning they're mandatory and you have to do them. And then some allow you to select or see how many credits you can get in certain categories. And that's how you kind of uh, do the exercise of LEED. One thing we did, and I didn't bring that here, but we spent a lot of time on looking at cost benefit relative to each credit. So we looked at what was the cost to implement a specific credit, and then obviously what benefits they were other than just getting the credit, right? So we did a lot of that, and I'll show you some summary version of that in, on the next slide. Um, but ultimately what we decided was looking through this, we felt like we could achieve uh, gold. And we came up with the fact that we thought we could uh, target 66 points, which is six more than what you need for lead. And then what happens with lead, and this is a version four, so it's much more difficult than the previous versions. And I did point that out when we were undertaking this. We felt, so what you do then is you can uh, submit what are called design phase credits. You can't actually get lead gold until the project is done completely. That's when you can actually say you got lead gold. But you, they allow you, because they recognize the process, they allow you to submit what's called a design phase. And majority of the points are in design phase, a good vast majority of them. So what we did is we submitted for 48 points. And we, were, we didn't do this until after bids. So... Um, what happened is when we got bids, one of the things we really needed in order to get this, these, uh, this project to be lead gold is we needed solar panels. That was a big cost item. So what we did is we structured the bids to allow us to hedge our bets by making that an alternate. So we found out exactly what the price was on bid day. And then I also structured the alternate to allow us to withdraw, take back those monies before the guy ordered the solar panels. And that date is April coming up pretty soon. Okay, so we set that up and that's the way the contract is written for the solar panels within the electrical contract scope. All the other items that we felt we were targeting, we just left them in the bids. We couldn't pull them out because they were very small amounts relative to the um, solar piece. So we went ahead and submitted it and about a month ago we got notice back that all 48 points that we submitted for design phase we are eligible for, meaning they, you can't get them right now, but they've basically gone through our review and they've got no comments. So we're eligible for them. So what that did is it confirmed what I had said originally, which is we thought we could get to the 66 or at least the 60. So what happens now is we have to just submit the remaining points and we can't submit those until the end of the project. But we believe that at this point we're in good position that we could even lose six of them and would still get to 60. And we'd make sure we got the lead gold, which is a requirement of the ACE grant, okay? And so we've got an ACE grant. It's not as much as we applied for, and that's something that obviously none of us had control over, but we have those uh, funds to apply towards this project. And um, at this point, I think the decision was we would, as we had promised, we'd come back to you after getting the design phase. 
and give you a final opportunity to um, either proceed um, as you have done so far or decide not to proceed with a combination of both the lead gold, um, ACE grant, and the solar panels obviously would go along with that. And I think that's what the agenda item is. So if you go to the next sheet, um, and that's the sheet that has the project costs. So if you, if you look on the bottom, what we had done on the bottom, the ACE grant is $1,368,000. You see that number in red there? And what we had said was, um, including all of the costs, the line above, we have felt that, uh, and I feel very comfortable with that number. In fact, I know we're going to be less than that, 997505 So basically, we are getting benefits that the um, process will give us, and I'll identify a couple of them. But in addition to that, there's also all the costs are being covered, plus some are being used to perhaps offset the rest of the building. And that's really the bottom line. The one thing I'd like to just go back and explain now what I mean by, if you look at project costs, and then I said solar ongoing benefits. Um, so if you can please go back to one, the slide before, which has the um, lead gold. There you go. So one of the things I just wanted to point out, and what I was saying about environmental and energy design. So if you look at the credits, right, the most air, the high credits that you can get is what's called energy and atmosphere. You see that? It's on the left side, and it's the last one down, and it's 31 points you can get. So just imagine, you can get 31 of, a, of basically of the 60 that we're targeting, half of them in that category. And then you go down a little, and you look at the one that says optimize energy performance. And the maximum points you can get there are 16. And we are getting all 16. So we focused very heavily. That's what we did. Our strategy was combination of the solar panels, combination of the building envelope, combination of the HVAC systems, combination of the lighting systems. And so we have a building that is going to produce results in terms of energy savings ongoing for a long time, as well as the fact with the solar credits, there's an energy offset that we won't be buying power off the grid for a long time. So those are the type of ongoing benefits. In addition to that, certainly we're you know, being a model for the stakeholders and, and the public uh, in terms of designing a sustainable building um, with water saving features, you know, recycled content of materials, um, proximity of where we're getting materials from, uh, so on and so forth. I could keep going, but this is not a, a lead session here. So I think that's enough. All right. All right, any comments or questions on the lead discussion, Art? So the big question, Arif, is you, you've done these projects before and you've been at this point. Uh, has there been any projects where you thought were going to be gold and it ended up they were not, that there were some issues as the, process, as, as the building progressed? Uh, First of all, uh, what I told you before was this is our second um, version four version building. Four. And there's very few buildings. In fact, there's no other building out there, school building that's complied with version so four. So you've done so, one other district that's version four. So right now we're finishing up um, Rolling Hills Elementary School in Council Rock School District, and that's a version four. They unfortunately got two million. <laughs> they got two million. So, um, but uh, that's the only other version four that we're doing. So I have a lot of experience with 2009 and we never failed any one of them. But I'm just telling you, I think six points and when you look at what they are, we can lose six points and still be there. We got all of the 48. So, you know, there's no guarantee, but I don't feel like um, we're going to be in a position where we can't get it. We also have a few credits that if we had to in the end, um, for lack of a better word, we could buy meaning we could pursue a couple other credits that are in the maybe column. Yeah, I was going to say there's that, four, four points that are maybe. That yeah, two of them are really challenging, but maybe yeah. two we could, we could hit. And, um, but we don't want to, I, I, don't, I think we're going to be okay. I mean, that's the I answer I can give I think the you. good thing was when we, we started looking at this for the new board members, we, we were concerned because we didn't get the $2 million, but also at that time we thought the solar was going to be $900,000. Yeah. And it ended up when the bids, when we opened up the bids, 
that the solar ended up being five and a quarter, 525,000. Correct. So that significantly helped us in terms of looking at the total costs and what we would gain, you know, how much we would end up. We thought we were breaking even, but now it's going to give us a little bit money, I think, on the, on the positive side. That was the nature of my question, or even on the solar panels. And forgive me if this was asked before my time on the board. I mean, we, we think Borough's got a good number given that they're that far under budget. Absolutely. I mean, that's a guaranteed number at this point. Yeah. Anyone else? Did you? Where do the solar panels come from? Are they local made? Or are they coming from China with some issues? with supply there or can you elaborate it's a great question so actually right now I don't have the answer because we have not authorized them to provide a submittal or do anything relative to that because obviously we couldn't we have the option to <laughs> withdraw it um, so we haven't asked them for any specifics on that other than to hold the price I, I can get you that information once we uh, proceed but and then the other thing is the timeline for it is to be completed. So, for example, if the, the, the panels take a little longer to arrive, does that impact the ability to earn the points? Is there, is there a time limit in which you get your um, certification or is it, it it's we, a good, we, tell, it, we tell them, hey, we're ready, come and inspect, give us our points? Yeah, it's actually a little bit. It's a little bit easier than that. First of all, I don't see any issue from a timeline of execution and getting these and putting them on the roof in time for occupancy and, and substantial completions. I don't see that as an issue. We've got plenty of time for that. But secondly, this is all strictly based on an energy model that we submit, and it's really being verified by us and the professionals. There's really no lead police that comes out and actually checks it. It's primarily on our system based on your submissions and the data you submit. It's not um, really monitored other than them reviewing the submittals you make online to confirm what you believe is accurate. There is a commissioning agent and we have to give them the commissioning report. So there is a third party commissioning if you looked on the sheet um, there's actually, that's a big number, it's 125,000 for a commissioning agent, and that's a requirement. So that's the way they kind of police it is, now you have a third party confirming what the professionals are saying for the, for the client. That's how it's done. Anyone else? All right, so Arif, what is the formal process that we need to go through to decide whether or not to proceed? Do we, are we? I think <laughs> giving you a go ahead or do we have to do we need a well it'd be nice if we... you just gave us a nod but I think we prepared an agenda item with uh, Andy yeah. and Bob and it basically is just saying that what you said before is fine essentially <laughs> yeah there, there's an agenda item that we'll have on the on the legislative uh, agenda that basically authorizes us to move forward or you know waive our right to withdraw from that from that uh, alternate at this point, and basically giving them the go-ahead to move forward. Okay, so um, all right, well, so we'll take it to, when we get to that discussion item. We will. Uh, is it one of these? To, no, so it's not on tonight's it's, discussion. It's part of this part discussion of this, all right, tonight so, to move forward, and then the, the formal right. agenda item will so be I Monday guess night. Right now, we need the committee members um, to weigh in. Do we want to move this forward to the to the? To the meeting, Amy. Yeah. Okay. So we'll move that forward, and uh, we will vote on it on Monday. No. When, when, yeah. Monday. Monday. Okay. Thank you again. So thanks, Arif. Thank you, Zach, uh, for the presentation. Um, and our next item uh, is a change order from J D James D. Morrissey. Uh, yes, just a really a clean up change order to process their final payment. Uh, this was for the uh, the road work improvements, the roadway that was needed. Uh, there were two items that were outstanding, they just need to be uh, satisfied, documented. Uh, it was a change order three, is in the amount of 20,417.08. Uh, 
the one item was there were some traffic light uh, modifications that they made. Uh, there are requirements uh, from PennDOT that we had to make some modifications uh, since that intersection is PennDOT's intersection. And the, uh, the last one was for unsuitable soils. That's on the 20,417.08. All right, comments or questions? Okay, so we will move that forward to the legislative meeting. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Oh, hang on before you go. I have to find the budget. Is that uh, the construction costs as of February 14th? Is that included in there? Or well, that will be added to the, is that the HOP contractor in the budget? Yeah. I don't know if it's probably not included because we haven't approved it yet, but it would have to be added to that. Correct. And just that. I mean, we, we budgeted 764309 now. Is, has, has that all been spent? Is that why we're doing the, this additional cost? I mean, it, it was originally 618584. The current budget is 764309. We spent 511. We have a balance. So, just, so the actual spent to date is just bills paid. So right. But all of this will be spent. Plus the additional. That's correct. Yeah. And we started at 618, which was a high number for road improvements for a school that was already on the same ground that we are building a new building on. So to clarify, the 764 number will increase by the amount of this uh, change order. Is that right? Let me confirm that and just just get back to you. Okay. Uh, I'll confirm that for certain. All right. So we'll have we'll we'll finalize that discussion on Monday. All right. Anyone else? Make him stand up and then make him sit down again. Okay. No. All right. We're all set. <laughs> Thank you guys. All right. Let's move on to the finance reports and recommendations, starting with treasurer's reports. Anything to call our attention to here, Andy? Yeah, so just a couple a couple quick things here on the treasurer's reports if you're looking at them. Um, up until this point, we've been generally in line with where we've been in prior years. There's a couple minor things just to note. So um, this year to date, we have 83% of budgeted revenues received as compared to 85% last year. So still very much in line, but we, you know, we've moved apart 2%, which, you know, on a $100 million budget, that's a um, a large number. So the, the reasons for that are primarily, if you notice, on the interim tax line item. Um, last year we had a large, um, large interim tax bill that came due. So um, we don't have that again this year. And then we've also, the state transportation subsidy that we receive on the state line item is lagging last year. Um, it's actually in queue for us to receive um, in February. Um, but, you know, we receive 400 plus thousand dollars of state subsidy on transportation. So that's um, that should all clean up next month with the transportation subsidy. And on, I was told also that transportation money is getting delayed and delayed and delayed, and they keep pushing it, I believe, at, at the state, that's what I was told. It is. Actually, that delay, that delay that you're referring to sort of happens at the end of the year. They don't pay out the final amounts that are due, and it starts to in the push into year, the following and that year. that portion is larger and larger. That's correct. That, that is occurring. On the expenditure side, um, we've... Uh, we have 53% of expenses um, recognized this year as compared to 50% in the prior year, and that's basically driven by January. Um, if, you, if you know how payrolls work on a biweekly basis, there's typically 26 pays within a year. So two months out of the year, you have three pays, and every other month you have two pays. This year, that three-pay month occurred in January. Um, last year, it occurred in March. Um, so come March, we expect that to kind of move back in line. So that's all I have on Treasurer's Report, if there's no other questions. All right, any, any questions, comments? Stan. If, um, what uh, item would, you know, um, salting and snow plow, would that, what budget item would that be under, or we recognize, obviously, we're going to be saving some money there. Yeah, I, come on. <laughs> I put away my snow plow already. I did. 
Yeah, so so if you're if you're looking at the treasurer's report, basically the way the treasurer's report lays out, and specifically to your to your question, Stan, is under the expenditures we have it grouped by function, which are basically major categories. Um, so plowing would be one of many expenditures that fall under the twenty six hundred, the operations and maintenance line item. So I'm not sure, Mr. Lester, but I think we have we do most of our own work in house, um, but we do have a. a, a $10,000 line item for, you know, potential outside plowing services. So the lack of snow isn't necessarily a big savings in terms of plowing. There, there well, certainly helps in terms of heat and other factors. It'll be well. like wear and tear, you know, sidewalks, less damage to sidewalks. And I mean, I know we had a lot of concrete work done during the summer. The longer it cures, you know, less salt damage. Bob knows what I'm talking about. All right, anyone else? All right, let's move on to the audit report. Okay, so uh, everyone at their seat tonight has a, a hard copy of our, our most recent audit report. Um, there's also an electronic copy that was posted with the agenda. Um, so every year, um, school districts have to go through a full audit of their financial statements. Again, I think we've already reported on the numbers from last year, and this audit doesn't change anything from what's already been reported. Um, but this is just to confirm that um, we've received our final audit, and it's something that needs to be accepted by the board on an annual basis. Um, so while there's a lot of valuable information, um, you know, that's a 100-plus page document of all of our financial statements, all of the auditors' um, opinions, um, there's a, a couple important parts that I would encourage you to look through the whole thing, but I would especially encourage you um, to read through the management discussion and analysis, which is, you know, starting on page 10. And basically what that does is um, we are responsible as a district for writing our discussion and analysis, a summarized plain language version um, of all of our financial statements. So that's, that's more plain language. Um, when you get into some of the financial statements, that gets a little more complex. But our discussion and analysis takes all of the financial data and, and puts it into plain language. And then also on page 115 and 116, that's essentially our scorecard for the audit. So the auditors did a whole lot of work here. They went through all of our financial statements, a lot of financial records. Um, and they issued an unmodified opinion, which is essentially saying it's a clean audit um, with no findings. So certainly I give kudos to um, Jen Baldassano, who couldn't be here tonight because she's not feeling well, um, and our whole business office team for um, their work here uh, in, in having a clean audit. Um, if you've never been through an audit, you have no idea how much work goes into it. We do it all in three days on a $100 plus million dollar budget. Our audit team comes in, and, and they have about 10 people with them, so it's, it's a lot to manage. So, um, so kudos to, to Jen and the team. So I'll be happy to answer if there's any specific questions on the report. Comments or questions? All right. Well, congratulations on yet another clean audit. Um, Andy, P. just wanted to talk about the two findings. They weren't findings, but there was one where there were double postings. Over, over over fiscal years, and it was posted twice. I think they they were they were minor items. I mean, you know, I don't know what page that was on specifically. Yeah, it's near the beginning. I think I think one just had to do with where they they found um, accounts payable items where we had. We had booked the expense in last year and then booked it again this year, um, which they identified the double booked expenditures. So they were, again, minor items, but it was something that, was, that the auditors definitely in, in their review um, uncovered. Um, the activity fund reimbursement, what they found here is, um, so, so when our student activities funds, as an example, at the high school, um, when we uh, if they're needing a purchase, the procurement of that still runs through our procurement process out of the business office just to make sure it's all um, being procured correctly. And what happens is the, the general fund will pay for that, and then the student activity fund will reimburse the district for those types of expenses. Um, I mean, that's a minor thing where the auditors just said, hey, that, that should be booked as an expense and then a revenue received from the student activity fund. It, it should be just flow through due to do from, which is an, an accounting transaction between, since we do fund accounting. 
Right. And, and to be clear, there's three levels of, of findings. There's the control deficiency, the significant deficiency, and a material witness. And these were both control deficiencies. I don't think I've ever gone through an audit uh, here or even at Eastern where they're not going to find something. They, they, need, they, they almost feel like obligated <laughs> to find something. And if it's a control deficiency, that's, that's a good thing. You know, and, something, and, and, and it just reminds us that we have to continue to improve what we do. Yeah, and, and what I would say to that, you know, we, not, not that we want our auditors to find things, but I think that's part of the benefit of having an independent audit, right? You want your auditors to come in and, and give a good review and make sure they're covering everything. And, and we want recommendations and feedback on an annual basis, right, just to make sure everything's clean and working properly and efficiently. So, you know, that, that's part of, part of what they do for us. All right, and then following on with that, we have a new three-year agreement with Gorman. Yeah, so th this was the last year of our three-year audit engagement with Gorman and Associates. Um, so one of the, we are recommending uh, to continue on in our engagement with them in a new three-year agreement. Uh, I know I'm new here, but I certainly haven't found um, any concerns with Gorman. We've been, I know the business office has been very happy with the services they provided. Um, just in May 2017, there was a full RFP that was done, um, and Gorman and Associates was the low-cost provider, so there's certainly benefit to, to staying with um, Gorman. The services they provide are solid. Um, they work with us. It's an efficient process, so um, our recommendation is to continue forward uh, with a new three-year engagement. Comments or questions? Dan? Um, what were the fees for this past audit? Do you know, Andy? And if there was any uh, hourly additional charges, uh, it, it was. It was, I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but I believe it's it's twenty five thousand dollars is approximately the number that we pay for the all the services they provide. So it was very much in line with what we were looking at. And there's no rule like if obviously they didn't really find anything with this. I mean, we couldn't skip a year. This is a state mandated. <laughs> No, there, there's no skipping years. A, an annual audit is a, a requirement of the of school district business offices and okay, financial and this statements. Okay, this is an unfunded mandate, right? We have to pay for this, and the state main, mandates us to do this. Uh, we, we are required as our most large organizations to have an annual financial audit just to make sure their, their financial statements are in order. And in this so, particular yes. case, I think we would probably want to do it anyway, even if it weren't mandated. I would absolutely want to do one every year, yes. All right, any other comments or questions? All right, so we'll move that one forward to the legislative meeting. Let's move on to the MCIU member services budget. And then maybe a quick reminder of what was announced at the beginning of the meeting as well. Yes, yeah, certainly. So I'll, I'll cover that as I move through. So e each year, member districts are required to take action on a specific portion of the uh, intermediate unit's budget. So you have the whole document here for the, the Montgomery County intermediate unit. Um, and the specific portion of the budget is the membership services budget here with MCIU. Um, so the budget, and they gave us a summary in there, is made up of three areas, the Office of Community and Government Relations, Office of Pro Professional Learning, and Office of Technology Services. Um, the budget packet provided includes all the details of the services that are provided under each of those areas, um, but I want to make sure it's clear that um, this is a completely separate budget from their, their special education programs and services budget, right? This is um, sort of our required contribution to the MCIU budget as being a member school district in, in the Montgomery County um, with their organization. We also pay separately for any special education and training services that the MCIU provides. So the total of this budget is about $1.85 million, and they note that that really is only about 1% of their entire organizational budget. So it's a very small piece of what we're talking about here. Um, this budget only increased by about $50,000, but the, the actual school district contributions into, the, into that did not change at all. So they're covering whatever that, that increase is by other sources within their budget. Um, the Upper Dublin share is $64,951, which is a $444 decrease from 
the current year and again the the, the item on the agenda um, basically had the last year's numbers in it so it was updated to include 1920 as compared to 2021 is a 444 dollar increase or decrease so questions on any of that comments or questions okay so we'll move that one forward to the legislative meeting and next up we have an agreement with Gallagher for benefit services consulting Okay, so kudos to um, Ms. Kitten, Ms. Kitten, who is our HR director. Um, I think just about every, as she's looking out at her budget for next year and every contract that comes up, she's taking a really close look at it and figuring out, do we need these services? Can we, can we ask our vendor for um, a lower price? Can we reduce our services for a lower price? Um, so this is one of those areas where, um, through our discussion, she worked with Gallagher um, to request a, a reduced expense for next the next three years. So um, the HR and business office have contracted annually with Gallagher, Arthur Gallagher, for the last three years um, for services around um, benefits consulting. So the, you know, if you're familiar with healthcare benefits, that, that world is constantly changing on a daily basis. Regulations, compliance, um, it, it's changing every day. Evaluation of consortium to consortium. Um, so we use their services and have for a number of years, um, and they've charged us about $26,000 per year for those services. Um, so through looking at the services that they provide and knowing that you know, we just settled a, a couple of contracts um, and we may not need some um, services related to benefits analysis for the next couple of years, we asked for a reduction in price and a reduction in services um, it's at a cost savings of about $19,500 over the next three years. So you can see how it lays out per year. Instead of $26,000, year one is $14,500, year two is $19,500, and year three is $24,500. So that's Arthur Gallagher. And I believe they do come and, and they'll give a presentation once a year and talk about what's going on in, in the benefits market um, and our current benefits um, consortium that we participate in. Comments or questions? Okay, so should we uh, expect to see any at the board level, any any anything visible to us in terms of the, the change in uh, services that we're asking for? There, there will be nothing visible from the board level, no. All right, so we'll move that one forward to the legislative meeting. And next up, we have a settlement stipulation for 1650 Susquehanna Road. So uh, assessment appeals, my favorite topic since I've been here. Um, we have a settlement stipulation here for the board's consideration for 1650 Susquehanna Road, which is Dresher Senior Living. And this is, this is a little complex. So, um, you know, there's been, uh, court, there's been a trial over this. It's already, um, it's been discussed out there. So I just want to make sure we cover it so we know what's happening. Um, basically, this back in 2000 and 18, um, this uh, Dresher Senior Living filed an assessment appeal to have their assessment reduced. Um, it was denied by the Board of Assessments. Um, when it's denied, a property owner has 30 days to appeal that, um, and they did not appeal in a timely, in a timely fashion. Um, they went to court and asked for um, the court to still hear their appeal. They believed that they did what they needed to do. Um, for that appeal, um, but there was no record of them having done that. So um, our solicitor feels like, um, you know, in the, the court appearance, um, everything points to the direction of, you know, they missed their chance to appeal this, um, and we should all just move, um, move forward. But the thing about assessment appeals is next year they have the ability to appeal again and, and take this back to a, to a court case. So um, the recommendation was, and it's actually already been approved by the county and the township, is to move forward with a settlement agreement with them. Um, even though they've missed, um, what they've agreed to um, is instead of this potentially costing the district um, uh, $16,000 for last year and $20,000 for next year and beyond, um, we're looking at a settlement of about a $10,000 tax loss. Um, for next year and out into the future, not owing anything back into the past, and um, they would they've agreed to not file any more assessment appeals for the next two years. Um, so this sort of locks in a, a loss of ten thousand dollars for the next two years 
Um, whereas if we do nothing, they'll appeal next year. It'll become, um, you know, we'll be in court and we'll be battling this. There'll be legal fees and and and, and more on that. So the recommendation is to approve this um, this settlement stipulation again in line with what the county and township have already agreed to to approve, and they've already signed off on. And comparatively speaking, uh, relative to other assessment appeals we've discussed recently, this one is quite small. Um, any uh, other comments or questions, Stan? I mean, this building's not too old. I mean, I remember when I was commissioner, we this was built less than 10 years ago. And I, I'm, I'm assuming it's totally occupied, it's at capacity. Anybody, did they, do the appraisers look at that, that this company's making money and they still think this building is not worth four, oh, ten, nine, nine and a half million dollars? I, I'm, I'm wondering how much it cost to build that building back 10 years ago, whenever they built that. Do the appraisers look at, into that, those, uh, you know, into that data? The, the appraisers have their models and, and they look at all of that data. Um, the thing is, one appraiser's model is different than another appraiser's model. So, uh, you know, our appraiser comes up with a number, their appraiser comes up with a number, and then if there's no settlement, the court decides whose number is right. I mean, that, that's essentially in, in as simple a terms as it gets what happens. So, so yes, that's all considered, but if, if it goes to trial, then it's up to a judge to determine you know, which, which analysis or calculation is more credible. I think we should look into that. At, if this appraiser does look into the data, what, what kind of data are they submitting to, you know, to the court? I'm just interested in, or wondering if they use those different, you know, areas of income. I mean, the, the building's got to be making money. Are you asking that sort of in general terms or this specific case? Well, I'm wondering if, uh, you know, I mean, the appraiser is $5,000, you know, for basically each appraiser. I'm, I'm just wondering if they do look into that data. That's all part of the process. They're looking into, um, I don't know if it's necessarily when it was built, what the value of, but they look at um, what the current market value is that they've uh, assessed it at. They look at, um, is it occupied? How occupied is it? Um, so, so that all goes into the the analysis. Okay, the the ruling that that they didn't show, you know they didn't submit an appeal on an appeal quickly enough. What happened with that appraisal that the school district submitted, or they didn't have to do it? They just said, you know, we're we're not going to. Uh, we, we believe this building is uh, nine and a half million dollars. What what happened to that appraisal? I'm not sure I understand. What, what I mean, do you mean, what happened were, to the appraisal? Yeah, and they appealed something, right? They didn't appeal it in time. What was it that they appealed? Yeah. So, so they, tried so they, to they submitted an annual appeal to the Board of Assessments of Montgomery okay. County. The, the Montgomery okay. County Board said, we, the Montgomery Board said, no, we're not changing your assessment. They, they felt it was fairly assessed. And then the property owner appealed to the Court of Common Pleas and said, we don't agree with the Montgomery County Board of Assessment. You know, we, we want further further court ruling on this. So in this case, to clarify, we did not hire and pay for an appraiser because it never got to that point. Yes. It has not not got to that point yet. So we're not so we're just like I how do you say, trying to be proactive and saying, Okay, let's let's settle and we're gonna lose ten thousand dollars. And all they're doing, all they did was threaten, and then we're, we're settling just because they're threatening us? Well, the, the alternative is to build a court case and go to court and pay legal fees. So that Well, the alternative is to get an assessment, um, get an appraisal of the property first. Then, then see what happens, right? Which is, so we'd be paying $5,000 for that. Half plus, of that, because the other half would be with the township. It's not half, it's prorated. So we, you know, we're 80 plus percent of, of the. Uh, of the taxes. Okay, so, and this one has already been approved. So we're the third of the three parties to approve this, um, or to at least consider it. That, that's vote. correct. This happened really quickly about a week and a half ago. Okay. So, um, so we'll move forward to the legislative meeting.
And then we can ask those questions of our appraisers in yeah. the next item. Because um, the perhaps. township has to approve this also. Is they that already, and they already have. And they already have. And so is the county. Okay, so let's move on. We have uh, an agreement with Valbridge Property Advisors for 1658 Susquehanna Road. Yes, yeah, so uh, approximately three years ago or two years ago, the district went through a process of um, district initiated assessment appeals. So this is the board has a policy on this. Um, it, it, it lays out the process to um, have district initiated assessment appeals. Um, and that, that process, um, a few properties were um, calculated to be above the $10,000 tax increase and the district uh, initiated that process. 1658 Susquehanna Road, was, which is um, yeah, 1658 Susquehanna Road was one of those properties. Um, basically, at this point, where we're at is we will we need to have an appraisal done. Um, uh, the, we appealed to the, the Montgomery County Board of Assessment. The Board of Assessment denied our appeal, similar to what's happening here. Um, but the district still feels like this is a property that we've identified that the assessed value is too low. So the next step in the process from our standpoint, since we've made the appeal to the Court of Common, Common Pleas, would be to have an appraisal done um, and then you know, move forward based on what that, uh, what that appraisal lays out. Um, at the district, at our estimated value, um, this would be an annual tax increase of about $25,000. Um, and then going back to the year when this uh, was actually filed, there'd be about 65,000 in one-time revenue um, available to us um, through that process if everything would work out in our favor. So um, our solicitor's recommendation is to move forward with the appraisal um, to determine what our next steps are. I just want to call attention. I, I just noticed that uh, the agreement talks about 1668, 1668, Susquehanna Road, and the agenda item is 1658. They're all part of the same property, it appears, um, but we should probably be consistent uh, uh, of, on the address as we move forward. Um, yeah, you think it's the entire property? It is. I CBS assume, and the, and the uh, townhomes, the rentals? Uh, I think it's just Probably. the townhomes, and the 1668 it's is that is a old building that's uh, right on Susquehanna Road, sitting in front of it. It's still vacant, but which is still vacant. <laughs> yeah. um, but I think we're talking about just. But in any case, Andy, if you could just look into we'll, that, we'll again. make sure that's consistent for, for Monday. For Monday. Uh, any other comments or questions on this item? Okay. So why? I just have a question. Why did this? Why are we here? In, I know we've discussed, and I think maybe already had an appraisal of this property. Is this, am I misremembering? I mean, I know we originally discussed this a couple of years ago. So, so this goes before my time, so I'm yeah. taking our solicitor's lead on this. So okay. I'm, I'm not aware of any might that have just been, been on the, the list to look at. Maybe. And maybe we're getting. That might be what I'm remembering. To that point, yeah. Yeah. We identify some potential properties. Okay. We'll move that one forward. Uh, and next up, we have property property tax rebate program discussion. So several months ago, we were asked to uh, look at what the North Penn School District was doing in terms of a tax rebate program. Um, and then we were asked to put it again on the agenda this evening so that we could uh, rekindle that rekindle that discussion. Um, wanted to see if there was still uh, board interest in moving forward with something akin to what North Penn uh, is doing. So I wanted to open that up um, for discussion. Um, and we'll take direction um, and bring back some information at next month's uh, uh, finance meeting if there's board interest in moving and moving forward with, with looking at a tax rebate program. Um, I think, you know, based on working where I do um, and seeing some of the information and some of the feedback from the community um, in North Penn, you know, I think it's been very positively received. Um, of course, we want to weigh any programming that we do in terms of a rebate, rebate with our long-term financial needs. That said, I, I want to get much better information about what the real cost might be um, because my hope is that we can make it work at least in some measure. Um, and I certainly would like more information about 
sort of the real dollars and cents behind it if we can get it. So just for um, people that might not be aware, for folks that might be watching the, the streaming video or watch the video, um, what North Penn is doing, they, they've based their work on the Pennsylvania property tax uh, rent rebate program um, for eligible residents of 65 years uh, of age or older, uh, widower uh, or widows 50 uh, years and older, and um, folks with disabilities 18 or older. Um, Mark, did you want to? Well, yeah, I was just going to do the same thing. Okay. So I have it in front of me just to be clear. So those people that Steve just mentioned, uh, if they have an income of $35,000 a year or less for homeowners or $15,000 a year or less for renters, uh, not counting Social Security income, then they are eligible for a maximum standard rebate of $650, although some can qualify for up to $975 back from the state on property tax. So what North Penn has done is for those eligible people, if you're eligible for the state program, then North Penn has leveraged that and given a percentage of the state rebate um, back as well. Uh, and I don't, I think the number may now be, it's been rising over time, I think it's 50%, I'm not sure. I think it may be up to 50. Um, so if you got 650 back from the state, you get another 325 back from North Penn. That's the program we're talking about, um, looking into here, how much it would cost, um, what the impact would be, how many people would qualify, that kind of question. All right, other comments or questions? So I think what the administration is looking for is guidance. Are we still interested in pursuing this idea? I know when we were campaigning, we certainly it certainly came up with um, many of our seniors. So I think we should at least look into it um, to find out real data um, because we also realize that with our budget, our costs are increasing. So we have to be careful that we balance everything out. But I think that we need the information in order to make a good decision. There is a document, too, that comes out every year, uh, property tax rebate report, which provides a breakdown by school district of the rebates process at the state level. So that would probably be the first thing to look at. And uh, I think what North Penn has experienced, there's a significant number of individuals who do not uh, do the district rebate, but will do the state for some reason. Uh, so we shouldn't assume that anybody who's going to be eligible will will apply. There's also paperwork. There's also we would probably have to process it here, Andy. I guess you need to find out from North Penn. I think maybe Colonial is doing this now. I'm not sure uh, what what kind of procedures. I do know that they. Uh, it's a simple application that uh, gets distributed to our local legislators who help uh, the seniors complete the application and forward it to the district. I, I think we should, we should definitely look at it. I brought this up uh, months, you know, a few months ago, and I think it's something we should definitely look at and see what the cost would be. Yeah, we definitely ran into some people when we were campaigning who, you know, we're talking about $400, maybe somebody would get back, but for a senior living by themselves, that goes a long way. It would really be impactful and seems like the right thing to do if we can make it work in our budget. Anyone else? All right, I'll also just point out there have been motions in the legislature, um, nothing that's reached a, an actual floor discussion, um, but to expand the state's program in various ways, either expanding the amount that's paid, expanding who's eligible, that kind of thing. Um, I don't know, it doesn't feel like there's any real momentum around any of that happening anytime soon, but if we're using those qualifications from the state rather than our own qualifications, um, we should keep an eye on that to determine uh, what impact that might have on us if anything does move forward there. One of the reasons we did not bring it back up until now, as you know, there have been five proposals uh, for property tax elimination. And, you know, several years ago, uh, Mr. Lechman and I, when we were in another district, we faced uh, uh, possible non-reciprocity with EIT for folks that were working in New Jersey. Um, that really didn't get uh, much traction. 
Um, and when property tax el elimination first came on the scene several years ago, it was uh, driven by uh, a state representative uh, in the Schuylkill Valley area where uh, folks are paying an incredible amount of taxes on properties that are not valued anywhere uh, near what they're valued here in southeastern Pennsylvania. Most recently, there were five uh, possibilities, five plans, five proposals uh, for consideration of property tax elimination. So um, it does not look like at this point any of those will get legs. Um, that said, I do believe at some point one of those plans or an amalgamation of plans will continue to swirl around and at some point there w one of them will get uh, traction. But um, now seeing that nothing's going to get tra traction in the short term, we can take a look at this. The irony is there was a bipartisan uh, committee that was established in the House to look at it. There were Republicans and Democrats that worked together to come up with with the five different options that include reduction or elimination, two plans recommended. But there's an offset. There's the offset of income tax and sales tax. Right. And I think when you look at the state budget and what they, what they assume is going to come in every year and what actually comes in every year is not balanced. And so I would be worried about Harrisburg dividing up money and sending it back to districts. I think uh, one of the things that at the superintendent level through PASA, through our legislative meetings, we're really calling on uh, a common sense approach to the fair funding formula with uh, removing some of the hold harmless types of things. Um, but I do, I do worry that at some point the property tax elimination is going to come back in a big way. All right, so uh, I think I hear a clear uh, direction from the board that we would like to continue to discuss this. Um, and uh, looking at a starting point at the way North Penn does it and, and see how much that would cost and how many of our people would be eligible. Right? Yeah. Okay. All right, so that's it for the reports and recommendations. We're up to community input. If anyone would like to address the committee no all right so seeing none we'll close community input our next finance committee meeting is wednesday march 18th at 6 p.m right here in the high school cardinal room and we are adjourned thank you <laughs>